Hey there everybody, it's Mark Crowley. I'm back with another video. Today's focus is going to be on comic book storytelling and in particular on writing scenes, writing and illustrating scenes for comics. And my approach to uh, giving my advice today is going to be to look at one scene and one scene only, take you through it uh, panel by panel, break it down, explain all the different decisions that I made, and hopefully uh, in doing so give you a lot of good advice uh, about storytelling. Well, let's not waste any more time. Let's go ahead and get into it. Okay, so this is a scene from Brody's Ghost, book three. I think what I'll do is just kind of throw you into it. I'm not going to give any um, prefatory remarks. I'll just take you through the scene, panel by panel, let you experience it as storytelling, and then we'll come back and we'll go through a second time very slowly, uh, kind of meticulously even, uh, so as to break it down and explain how I came up with all this stuff. But for now, let's go ahead and begin the scene. At night, while Nicole slept, I continued my training with Kagemura. The goal now was to hone my powers until I could sense death echoes from ordinary objects. Try again now. One of these belonged to a man long dead and gone from this world. Focus, and its cry will be heard. Look, I need a break. Will you stop being such a wuss? You're staring at stuff. How hard can it be? You are at the precipice. If you stop now, you will squander all the progress you have made. Do you know how it feels to go four days on two hours of sleep? Oh, right. Forgot. You're ghosts. Focus now. Unfold your consciousness. A death echo can never be heard by one whose head is clenched like a fist. The pen. Good. Good. You saw something. It was a death echo, wasn't it? What did you see? An old man. He'd committed suicide. Yes! You're glad he committed suicide? Brody, people die. Happens all the time. Happened to me, come to think of it. The important thing is you know how he died. And you didn't need to be there when he did it. All you needed was to make a psychic connection with an object the guy once owned. This is the breakthrough we've been waiting for. It's how we're going to nab ourselves a penny murderer. Seriously, we could have him within the next couple days. You move too quickly, child. The knowledge you seek is remote in time and space, almost imperceptible to one whose greater senses are still in their infancy. Without further training, his abilities will be sporadic and incomplete. Incomplete, I can deal with. It was the totally not there at all thing that wasn't working for me. So he's done for the day, right? Indeed. He is spent. There can be no more progress tonight. I was so exhausted I barely remember walking home. I could have slept the whole next day if circumstances had allowed. They didn't. All right, so that's the scene, and now we can get into analyzing it a little bit. Um, uh, basically, whenever you write a scene, whether it's for comics uh, or for a movie or anything, uh, the scene, generally speaking, has a goal. It has one purpose. Uh, and in this case, the purpose is to show Brody making a breakthrough in his training. Brody has been training with this uh, sort of Yoda-like ghost character named Kagemura to help him unlock his powers. Um, in this scene, uh, we need to see Brody get to the point where he can gain psychic visions from ordinary objects. And so I came up with this idea of uh, Kagemura setting out a challenge at the beginning of the scene, uh, putting all these objects on the floor, and Brody needs to uh, discern which one of them belonged to a dead man. Um, this is just kind of a workhorse panel that sets things up, shows you where everyone is, uh, and uh, helps you to understand as things unfold the relationships, the sort of spatial relationships between all of the... Um, players in this scene. We, uh, these two panels, I would say, work together. We see Brody's uh, expression of concentration, and then we see what he's looking at. Uh, we see the pen and paper. Uh, 
uh, at this stage we don't know uh, how important that's going to become. Hopefully that can be a little bit of a twist later on. Uh, we move on now to silent storytelling, which I always say is, generally speaking, good storytelling. You know, there's no panels here saying, I picked up the pen. I wrote down the word pocket watch. No, we're not going to do that. We're just going to let the reader see it. And then, uh, of course, we find that uh, Brody has failed uh, to get the right answer. Uh, and he gets really angry and hurls the uh, pad of paper across the room. Now, basically, why? Why do I show Brody failing? Well, I figure we need to see him fail at least once uh, so that uh, when he succeeds, that will have power. Uh, if he succeeds immediately, then there's no drama to that. We want to see the frustration of him having failed, presumably many times. And that's when we move on to the next panel and uh, see the shocked reaction shots. You know, it's not very good behavior on the part of this pupil hurling the pad of paper across the room. Talia is like, I can't believe you did that. Kagemura, very little reaction. Uh, maybe he's used to this sort of thing. And uh, a little bit of humor here. Talia is kind of comic relief in this scene, I would say. Look, will you stop being such a wuss? You're staring at stuff. How hard can it be? Uh, and later on, she will have more of her reaction being kind of you know, comically unsympathetic. Uh, notice that whenever I write dialogue for uh, uh, Kagemura, he's always speaking in this kind of poetic way. You are at the precipice. If you stop now, you will squander all the progress you have made. Uh, so uh, the different characters speak in different ways, right? Talia is saying things like, wuss. Stop being such a wuss, dude. Uh, whereas he's speaking like he's from Shakespearean times or something. Uh, and um, uh, that's just a basic thing about revealing character by way of dialogue. Not just what they say, but how they say it. Uh, and then a little bit of humor here as uh, 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 Brody says, uh, you know, you guys know how it feels to go four days on two hours of sleep? Oh, right, forgot your ghosts. He gets his little moment of sassy <laughs> quippitude if that's a word. And now we move on to what uh, the reader probably knows even now is going to be the successful attempt. Notice how I do a kind of a zooming in effect here. We have uh, Brody at a distance with each panel. It's almost like the uh, Hollywood camera zooming in on the subject. Um, and uh, again, the poetic language, a death echo can never be heard by one whose head is clenched like a fist. Um, again, sort of Yoda-like in terms of Yoda had his, his unusual way of speaking. I felt that Kagemura had to have his own kind of poetic way of speaking. How do you like that? A black panel with nothing in it. Technically speaking, I got paid to make a completely empty panel, but it actually does serve a purpose. I think it shows that he has closed his eyes. He can't see anything. Uh, and that's setting up that he's about to have this vision. Uh, and I thought that that would help to sort of convey that. And the page turn, it's no coincidence that the, the vision takes place after the page turn. Um, I've hidden this behind the page turn so that it can have some impact that you don't see it coming. Notice the jagged edges here around the panel. All of this stuff, it's all a choice. I want to show that the vision is a, a different plane of reality, so the, the panels are drawn in a different way. All of the artwork gets kind of washed out and sort of has a, a, a white glowing kind of quality to it. Um, that is in contrast to the darkness of the earlier scenes. Not a coincidence. I mean, it made everything dark so that when he goes into the vision we get this washed out look. We get a maximum contrast. Uh, notice that sometimes uh, panels have no border at all. This one has no border. Uh, on the previous page, this one where he's sort of, uh, you know, exhausted and, and, and about to break down. Uh, again, I, uh, all of this stuff is a choice. Which one of these panels works best with no border? This is the one where I feel like let's pull back and give it a little, you know, breathing space. Um, and now uh, I had to be very careful about what I did in these five panels because really there are just one, two, three, four, five panels of the vision, each one of them serving a purpose. The first one showing us the, the setting, a sort of an establishing shot. We see the uh, old man. At this stage he might just be lying there. We don't necessarily know that he's dead. And indeed the second panel is for beginning to put that across to the reader. He looks dead in this uh, photo by the way I, I drew his eyes. And uh, then we have a sort of transitional panel where we still see him, but then we see this um, sheet of paper and these pills. And uh, that's when we begin to uh, zoom over to the letter. And uh, hopefully 
the reader at this stage is focusing mainly on the letter, the, letter, the pills maybe, oh, he left a suicide note. And uh, notice that there are some, there's some suggestion of what he's written here, but it's not like, I decided to <laughs> commit suicide. It's not as clear as that. It's like, please don't, and then that gets cut off, of responsibility in spite of my efforts to uh, made this decision uh, way to end the pain. All of them sort of like half sentences that if the reader takes the time to read that will uh, we'll begin to, you know, uh, put two and two together and see, oh yeah, this is his suicide note. Uh, then uh, that's the end of the jagged panels, and we go back to the normal panels and the, and the sort of dark background. Again, sort of maximum contrast as we pop back to reality. A little bit of visual storytelling. He reaches down and he says, the pen. So you can see this is the sort of minor twist that is supplied in this scene. I would say it is the moment that the whole scene has been building up to. We set up these objects on the floor. We hopefully have the reader believe that one of these objects is the is the one that he's looking for. And uh, then hopefully there's this sort of pleasant little moment when we realize, oh, it wasn't any of these objects. It was the pen that he was using. And uh, why? Why did I do that? Well, it goes back to this one rule of storytelling that I've uh, mentioned before in previous videos. Uh, it can't just happen. It has to happen in an interesting way. And uh, for me, having the pen be the object uh, rather than the objects on the floor, that was just my way of making this interesting. Uh, it would have been very undramatic to me if he just randomly chose one of the objects uh, from the floor. So then we move on to um, uh, Talia's reaction. Talia is so psyched that Brody has made this breakthrough. Um, what's kind of funny to me about this is it's not about Brody's personal growth or anything like that. It's about Talia is, you know, using Brody to get what she wants, which is progress in this uh, sort of uh, what's called a life task uh, that she has been assigned to go after this serial killer called the Penny Murderer. So she's like, all right, I can finally uh, begin using Brody to get closer to my goals. Um, but uh, there's an interesting moment of humor here in a way where Brody says, you know, it's an old man, he committed suicide. And Talia's reaction, yes! <laughs> like, oh, that is so awesome. And Brody's saying, you're glad he committed suicide? Of course she's not really reacting to that. She's just so excited about him having finally unlocked this power that she needs to make use of. Uh, but we do get a little bit of humor out of here where Brody says, or she says, Brody, people die. Happens all the time. Happened to me, come to think of it. And there's a lot of humor throughout the story derived from um, Talia's kind of very straightforward uh, um, response to the idea of death uh, and the fact that she has died. She, All of this is just treated in the most unsentimental um, way possible. To her, she's always very matter-of-fact about the whole thing. At this stage, I think we're getting to what might be called um, exposition, frankly. She's saying the important thing is you are able to use objects to gain psychic information. That's crucial. I'm going to be able to make use of this uh, as we pursue the Penny Murderer. Now, we don't know how she intends to use his power, but this sort of right here, I would say maybe in terms of writing, is maybe, I don't want to call it a weak point, but the sort of necessary evil of just putting across a lot of information to the reader all at once. Uh, basically saying, we've turned the corner, you've got this power, this power is going to help us get the panty murderer. Uh, and then from there on, it's a matter of getting from this, you know, breakthrough moment to Talia's explanation of why that breakthrough moment matters, and then winding down, I would say, basically. You can't just end a scene uh, abruptly. Certain things feel like the end of a scene, certain things don't. Now, this one is really kind of, again, what I'd just call um, work-a-day, wind-it-down time. Um, uh, Kagemura sort of cautions them that it, 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 it's going to take a lot longer uh, for him to, to use these powers than you think. You're not going to be able to uh, use them right away. And uh, again, uh, the, the contrast of his way of speaking, which is always very, you know, uh, sporadic 
and incomplete. Always these very high f language, fancy words. And uh, Talia being like, incomplete, I can deal with it. It was the totally not there thing at all. You know, the, uh, the, sh her way of speaking sounds so kind of casual by uh, comparison. For me, anyway, uh, always interesting to, to have your readers or have your characters speaking in drastically different ways. And then, yeah, this final panel really just drawing down the curtain on the scene. So he's done for the day, right? Indeed, he's spent. There can be no more progress tonight. And I would say that this panel actually marks the end of that scene, and this becomes a transitional scene that leads us towards the next one. I'm not going to go into that. It's the next um, uh, sequence in the story, but this one basically gives us a, a gap between the two, a segue uh, where he says, boy, I could have slept the whole next day if I could have, but uh, I wasn't able to. And then you're ready to turn the page and see why it was that he wasn't able to uh, sleep through the day the next day. But, you know, I hope that you found this uh, instructive in terms of uh, how scenes are thought through. I, the main thing, um, I've said it before, but I'll say it again, it's all about choices. You're, you're always making choices, you're always making decisions. Uh, from first panel to the end, everything is in there for a reason. Uh, you could have done it a different way, but you decided to do it this way because you think that's the best way, rather than just automatically, you know, doing it the first way that pops into your head. You should always be comparing different ways of doing it um, uh, before settling on the way that you hope is uh, the best of them all. But uh, let me know what you thought about this video and this this way of uh, analyzing this scene. Uh, I do uh, hear in the comment sections periodically from people who feel that these videos, uh, in which I'm not teaching how to draw but more sharing my thought process and, and so forth about comics, uh, that these videos uh, can be for them the, uh, the most useful uh, of them all. And uh, I certainly hope uh, that uh, Many of you out there have found this one useful as well. But let's go ahead and wind it on down. I want to thank you all for watching this video. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed it, and I'll be back with another one real soon.